You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 464. If it can be written or thought, it can be filmed. Stanley Kubrick. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Well, guys, today on the show, we have the definition of a film entrepreneur. Our guest today is Mike Dion, who is a documentary filmmaker who has made a living over the past decade applying all of the things I talk about in Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. He was doing it before I wrote the book. He's been doing it since about 2009, 2010. And what he's been able to do is he found a niche, which is extreme bicycle riding, like you know, bicycle riding across countries and things like that, following tours and other things. And he's been able to create multiple documentaries, successful documentaries, and started to feed and service that community again and again. And he's been able to sustain himself as a filmmaker by doing that for over a decade. And I wanted to kind of pick his brain on how he's been able to do that, what he's doing, how he's selling things, what are his ancillary product lines, what's making money, what's not making money, uh, and all those things. So this is a very educational uh, episode, to say the least. So if you want to learn how to make money with your film, perk up those ears because this is going to be one heck of a episode. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mike Dion. I'd like to welcome to the show, Mike Dion, man. How you doing, Mike? Doing good. Thank you. Good, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I, uh, our, our, uh, our mutual friend, Kia uh, Kiso, uh, who's also a friend of the show, been on the show as well. Um, she has been talking about you for as long as I've known her. She's like, you and Mike have to get together. You guys think alike. You got to do all this stuff. And you and I have been so busy. We've been just going back and forth trying to figure out times for us to actually do this. So we finally did this. And when I started to dig in deep into what you're doing, man, you are the personification of my book come to life. It is, it is you, it's like you, you got my copy of Rise of the Film Entrepreneur and went back in time. And like, I'm going to do this before anybody does. Like you were doing Everything I talk about in Rise of the Film Entrepreneur years ago, almost a decade now ago, um, when it wasn't cool and it wasn't the thing to do and self-distribution was like, are you insane? What are you doing? You were building up this, 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 this mini empire business that you've built over the years and I was just so blown away. So I, I needed to bring you on the show so you can share uh, all your secrets on... <laughs> 
<laughs> on how you do this so other filmmakers can follow your path. So before we get started, man, how did you uh, get into the business? I actually went to film school back in the day in a, in an amazing film school at State University. You know, I'm sure we've all heard of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was uh, started off there, graduated in the early 90s, and luckily enough, there were some films uh, being shot in Montana the year that I graduated. Far and away, a river runs through it, and luckily enough, uh, Professor Vars got us on set for for these you know, crazy, crazy ass films, getting to hang out with Ron Howard and Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt and, and Robert Redford. But I think interestingly enough, you know, kind of having this chip on your, on your shoulder, it's like, I should be directing these films. I shouldn't be like charging walkie talkie batteries for, you know, for Ron Howard's assistant, oh, you know? Oh, so, I want to be a film student. Oh. oh my God. Yeah. I look back <laughs> on that. I'm going, you silly child. So, but I think what was interesting about that is I almost got, you know, it, it's like, this was too big. This Hollywood stuff was 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 too big. So it almost kind of made it okay then to go get a job with a, a local um, video production company and start doing commercials and shooting and producing and editing and everything else. So that's kind of where it all started way back in the day. Now you um the the movie that kind of launched you into this this film entrepreneurial business model, if I may if I may coin my own word, um was Ride the Divide. Now. Ride the Divide, um, please tell people what Ride the Divide is and, and who who is it aimed at as far as an audience is concerned. Sure thing. Uh, Ride the Divide is a feature-length documentary film that covered an inaugural mountain bike race from Canada to Mexico, and it was centered on this cycling, ultra-endurance cycling, bikepacking. And back in the day, this was kind of a, a very under-the-radar event. It's the antithesis to things like the Tour de France. Um, it's the opposite of that, where it's all self-supported, there's no teams, and it wasn't really directed at anybody. It was one of those pure passion projects where here's this crazy event, we should capture it to the best of our ability um, and then see what happens to it. And, you know, what could have, you know, just been a YouTube video with some effort in the editing and the packaging actually became a, a real film that, um, you know, went on to do great things. So. So take me through the process because there was no rise of the film entrepreneur. There was no education. There's no information about what you're doing uh, like there is today. So how did you come to understand like, OK, well, we've made this movie. Obviously, our audience is one of our audiences is bikers and people who like to mountain bike and who are bike enthusiasts and cycle, a cycle enthusiasts. How did you begin to put everything together like wait a minute let's target these people and how did you target it in 2000 was it 2010 2010 early 2010 is when so it, uh, so my so myspace myspace was all the rage um yeah. <laughs> so there was yeah. no there was no facebook ads yet there I, was was there no ads facebook was facebook existed yeah, and sure Twitter existed but yeah there was weren't spending money on ads then Right, exactly. So there was no targeting like you could do now to find an audience and target and all that stuff. It was it was a lot more difficult back then. So it how was, did you yeah. so how did you start figuring this out? I think the mindset came the film got into the Vale Film Festival and it, you know, actually won Best Adventure Film at the Vale Film Festival and we packed the screening through our own efforts of putting the word out there. It's like, hey, our film is finally done. Come see it. So people traveled to Vail to, to come watch the film. And, and we sold out. There were people standing in the back of the room watching this film. And, and in my mind, it's it was like the Vail Film Festival is collecting all the ticket sales from this and we're not getting anything. We're not Correct. collecting any of this. So so that gave me almost it's like, well, shit, I'm going to start booking my own my own theaters. And one Thing that you know, being that it is sports, there was a, a ski film director, Warren Miller. I don't know if you ever heard of Warren Miller ski films, but he's been around forever. And I remember being a kid going and watching Warren Miller ski films in auditoriums and, and things like that. So, so he kind of had this model where take a film on tour, you know, book it, book a, a, an auditorium or a theater, sell tickets to the passionate skiers, and and kind of have prizes and giveaways and 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 you know, have a, have a good time. So that, you know, having that at, at, as a kid, but then wanting to, it's like, you know, monetize, collect my own ticket sales. Well, that kind of started it off. And then, you know, we booked the, the Boulder theater in Boulder, Colorado, which was 860 seat theater. And we sold 550 
tickets and, and had Gregory Allen Isakoff perform the you know, music who was from Boulder and also had some sound uh, songs in the film itself. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So that was the beginning of what kind of kicked off. It's like, I'm taking control of this thing. Yeah, because you um, uh, did you even try to go down the, the traditional distribution route? Yeah, most definitely. So we did um, get the film signed with New Video, uh, which in an mm-hmm. aggregator, which then got bought out and became Cinedime. So Cinedime did get us into iTunes and and did get us a, a tiny Netflix deal, super freaking tiny Netflix deal, and it got, you know got us into the the digital platforms. But then you know, we also you know, we're continuing the path of, of um, putting on our own events, um, putting our own DVDs up on Amazon and, and you know, direct-to-consumer type mentality of, of sales. So, oh, yeah, because I mean, so, so that was your first experience, but did you, did you get like, I don't say the word screwed, but it wasn't, it wasn't a distributor, it was an aggregator you were dealing with mostly? Yeah, well, yep, so we, no, they treated us pretty good for, okay. for you know, up until about year six or so, payments kind of stopped for a while. I think as as they kind of transitioned from new video to Cinedime, payments stopped. But but um, and there was a good year and a half where payments didn't happen. But then they started making good on on things. So um, I haven't been royally screwed, knock on wood, by by anybody yet. But you know, we haven't really kind of gone down the path of, of you know, I can recognize a, a shady situation perhaps and, and, you know, having enough belief in myself. It's like, no, I don't need you. This doesn't feel right. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm not going to choose you. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Now you say that you put the word out. How did you actually start cultivating this audience? Yeah. Fa- I think Facebook was, you know, it was early, it was early on and, and Facebook and, and actually Twitter, we were using, using Twitter. But then as we would put on our own sort of theatrical screening events, we tried t- to the best of our ability to connect with local, you know, bike shops and advocacy groups and, and partners in, in each city that did have potentially newsletter lists and email lists and, and, their own fan bases. So, so definitely as much partnership mentality as, as we could do to help spread the word. And then even forums, you know, thinking back. Oh to, yeah. You know, oh no. Forums I... were, were a thing. Message so, boards, uh, message boards, message oh, yeah. boards. Absolutely. So it was, it was everything and everything just kind of taking on that, that mentality of, of a PR um, type person. But you were going after cyclists and fans. Absolutely. And that, that's that's who. So you're going to message boards about cycling and bicycle enthusiasts and anything dealing with that that niche, if you will, that kind of audience. Um, Absolutely. And and just starting to pound them as much as you could. Um, uh, that's something I was doing in 2005 with a little short film that was aimed at independent filmmakers to teach them how to make a, a low budget independent film. Um, and I did it instinctively, kind of like you. I was just like, just kind of figuring it out. I'm like, wait a minute. The audience is here. I've got a product for them. Maybe I should connect these guys. These are my people. How do I present what I just created to my people? Right, exactly. And that's that's amazing. So so you start building it up. Did you start figuring out email yet at this point as far as grabbing email lists? And how important is an email list to you in, in your business model now? Huge, massive. Email list is freaking massive. And so we did cobble together a WordPress website. Wow. And we did start collecting emails from there and then did get um, sort of a merchant sort of aspect onto this cobbled together uh, WordPress a website. Account. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and it was e- oh, early on. E- e-junkie. Oh, oh, you did. Oh, you use e-junkie. I used e-junkie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. E-junkie. So e-junkie was oh. kind of how was the, the merchant piece to this cobbled together <laughs> uh, WordPress site. And, and, you know, we'd kind of put that together. And then what was interesting, we finished the website and then I think put, you know, put a link on, on, on Facebook or something and woke up the next, next morning and there was like seven DVD sales. And it's like, isn't that the, right, be- isn't that amazing? We're something isn't, isn't that the most amazing feeling? Yes. Like yes. when I, when I did that for the first time, when I launched, cause I've been talking to my, I was talking to my audience for months and they had trailers and people were like excited about this DVD. And the second I hit, send on that email 
like it was like I don't know to maybe like a th- five hundred people I collected over the over whatever, and I did it manually. <laughs> there was no email service. It was just like a manually sending it out to people back in the day. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, I would just hear PayPal emails. Ding, 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 ding. It was just the best. But then you had it, and that was the. That- <laughs> oh my god, dude! It's like I still I fulfilled everything out of out of my out of this freaking house for the last ten years. It's you know our garage has been filled with with boxes at at times. Um, but but you know that's that's the game. I don't know. It's the and game. that is the game, and and you know in because I'm fulfilling everything, I also get on a postcard to write a little thank you note, you know, John, thank you, exclamation mark, Mike Dion, put it in the package. So, you know, 98% of everything I've shipped out of here, people have got a little, you know, signed thank you card for me, you know, over the last 10 years. So it's that, I think it's that kind of mentality and strategy and thinking and caring about an audience. If someone's going to go through the effort of whipping out a credit card and sending you, you know, money, how should we not be appreciative for that? <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. Because a lot of times, you know, filmmakers, a lot of times think of it as almost transactional and it's not really grassroots. It's not really building a community. And it's because look, it's daunting to build a community. It's daunting and it's, it's time consuming. You know, this as well as I do. It takes years to build a passionate community. You have to provide a tremendous amount of value. You have to give them what they're looking for. It takes time. It takes time. But but I think you could attest to this. Once that audience is built and that relationship is solid, you can build upon that and continue to make new products and new right. films. And that's what you've kind of done. Yeah, it's it's to use e-commerce type, and you know, it's customer lifetime value. <laughs> so by putting in the effort of building a customer um, and or a fan, you've now then you know, have this customer lifetime value where if you do then have a new project and you want to send an email list, hey, here's my next Kickstarter, you you hit send and within 10 days, there's $25,000, you know, right? Because in an account because of, you know, of that effort that you just said you put into, into that audience building. And then also you were doing films in this niche because you just truly love this niche. Like you didn't right. do this, like all oh, the money's in biking movies. Like- <laughs> no, it's not like we should, you know, horror films are doing pretty good. Let's go make a horror film. It's like, no one ever said there's great money in bikepacking films. Let's go make a bikepacking <laughs> documentary said no one ever. <laughs> right. But, but once you figured out, but this is something you truly enjoy and, and you've been able to figure out how to monetize this for not just a year or two or not for one or one project or two, you've built an essentially a business, a full blown business around this, right? Yeah. And when you say monetize, it's, you know, it's, it's really just creating products for these particular people and then making the products available <laughs> to them. And, and the products just happen to be a, a film, a t-shirt, a poster, an experience, um, a, a how to piece of, of content. So, you know, I think we go into too much strategy of, of, uh, you know, what, you know, what's the hot commodity <laughs> right now? It's, it's like, no, if you were to go create a product, what would the product be that, that you enjoy putting out to your audience? And that, and that's the thing that filmmakers don't get is like, they'll, they'll just, cause it's art and I get it. Sometimes it's art, but if art, it's an expensive art form. So if you're going to do something that's expensive, you really need to fit, or it's going to take a year of your life. If you want to get paid for that in some way, shape or form, even if it is art, you really need to go, who's going to watch this? And that question is rarely asked. I find with independent films in general, they're like, who is this targeting? Who is this aimed at? Who's going to watch this? Yeah, I, you know, to if I often think of this like as a startup, you know, let's yeah. just, you know, like to have a startup mentality, I'm going to go create a SaaS product or I'm going to go, you know, create some consumer, you know, packaged good. <laughs> you know, I, I almost kind of take on the thought process of I'm going to go, I'm creating, you know, if this is a startup, if, if this film is, is a startup, exactly to your point. Who's the audience? How is it packaged? How are we, you know, what's the, what's the sales mechanism, you know, for this? How are we going to continue to create customers for, for this particular product? You know, I think from films, we get into this release, launch, work for three months, and then it kind of dies. But if you've got a nutrition bar, if that's your product, 
are you going to market that for three months? And then it's like, well, that was, you know, the end of my <laughs> promotion for this awesome nutrition bar that I just made. No, you're going to continue daily, weekly basis for years upon years upon years. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Marketing your product, so. Yeah, and that's the thing that that films. You're, you're right because films that like they, they think there's a shelf, a shelf life. A lot of times films, and sometimes they might there might be a shelf life. Like oh, that came out in 2019. I can't watch that. If the if the if the pandemic has taught us anything, I've gone back to movies I watched there 2001, 2002. I've gone back and watched old series that I don't remember anymore. And start watching those again. It's it, it, there is no shelf life. And, and by the way, ask any of the studios if there's a shelf life to their to their libraries. Are you kidding me? You know, I mean, Spielberg still I, makes five million a year. He said, I think I heard somewhere five million a year off of Jaws residuals. I I, <laughs> I, I get it, but it's a great story is going to have a shelf life forever. And I'm not sure if you're familiar. I don't read a whole lot of books but there's a book perennial seller by ryan holiday oh i know right yeah yeah i know right yeah so he's excellent perennial seller is is the idea of if you're going to put the time and energy into creating a piece of art whether it happens to be a painting or a book or a film or or music put in the extra energy and effort to make it a story that's got staying power that you're going to surprise and delight the world with this piece of art that you put all this extra thought and and energy into. And because it now does rise above and and has potential staying power, it becomes something that you can continue to market to 7 billion people in the world. No one's ever going to, you know, fully know your piece of art. So on it, you can continue to market it for your entire life and still not reach every potential person who could appreciate watching it or seeing it or hearing it. Right. And if, if you can figure out a way to automate that process, um, like with the, cause the website's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. So it's not like you have a lemonade stand that you have to close up after a certain time. If you figure out a way to automate that, meaning like you put out content into the world that they click on and like, Oh, Oh, there's this, or I watched this video. Oh, look, there's a link to the movie. If you're able to automate that, that is, that's where, that's when you start really getting into passive income and really start building that stuff. I've built my entire business around that. Like my, I've built this universe of indie film hustle and bulletproof screenwriting and all these other companies around this, this model of this ecosystem that I've created. And it's constantly working for me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And not only am I'm being able to get money from it, but I'm helping people. I'm, I'm educating people. I'm helping them on their journeys. My books, and I'm assuming the same thing with your movies. Um, they just, they just, every day I check there's someone bought a book. So somewhere in the world, someone bought a book. It's an audiobook, ebook, every, and it's constant. And when I got into the book, book publishing game with my first two books, oh man, I was just like, wow, this is, this is awesome. It just, it, and books are one of those things that they just go. Books just, you could find a book from 20 years ago. And if it's, as long as it's still relevant information, I mean, look, uh, what is it? Napoleon Hill. Um, you know, I mean, Jesus, you know, I mean, those kind of, those kind of self-help books and they, they just go on and on and on. So yeah. do, do you, do you have that same kind of, yeah, absolutely. But you say automation, but I wouldn't, you know, let people think automation is easy, right? So no. it becomes, it's, it is easy after the fact, but yes. once you've put the time and energy in creating the gears of the machine that once built then become a flywheel that have continue motion. So, you know, what does automation look like? It's website, it's SEO, it's putting out YouTube videos and with articles. SEO and content and links. And it is building Facebook content, Instagram content, and it is putting email automations in place when people do. So, but once you've put that system in place, then yes, it does have automatic <gasps> Yes, situation but, to it, but it takes a while. It takes yeah. y- years sometimes yeah. to put that together. But that's strategy, right? It, but if you've got that mentality, back again, this is my startup. This is my product. This is my sales mechanism that I'm mm-hmm. putting in place. And then once it's in place, 
80% of it is automation. And now the 20% that you're kind of putting, continuing to feed the machine on a daily or, or weekly basis becomes easier. <laughs> right. And like what you, you've done, because you had Ride the Divide, but then to continue to feed that beast, you you did Inspire to Ride. You did Reveal the Path, which were all like, um, not sequels, but they definitely all go together in a nice package, which of course you sure. could sell as a as a package, uh, <laughs> but that but you kept feeding that beast over the years, um, as well as we'll get into the, all the product lines and other things that you were built up. But just on the movie standpoint, you kept feeding into this audience and you kept giving them new fresh content, right? Correct. Yep, that that's right. So for for a good the, from 2010 to about 2007. 2018 it was it was exactly as you just described that was a full the full-time job really um, putting out you know films and, and content and marketing and then you know 2018 or so one of the main characters in my film inspired to ride was killed in a in a cycling oh. event and that not only put through me back but you know kind of the whole community so that put a, a wrench in things for a few years and it kind of reassessed um uh, some things and did a lot more sort of freelance work and contract work. So, but, you know, now it's kind of coming back into, uh, into the swing of things again and, you know, with new ideas. So, right, exactly. But still for but, this audience, but new distribution media company type ideas. That's, that's excellent. Now, when you were, when you were releasing your films, did you do a theatrical or self theatrical runs on this stuff? Yes. Every single one. And we, when the films first came out, we would do a good foot twenty to thirty city tour uh, with with the film, mostly mostly in the in the western states. I'm in Colorado, and you know a lot of cyclists between the Rocky Mountains and, and west. So so I'd go kind of hit a theatrical tour for six weeks or so, and then kind of made it available where bike shops and other pe entities could put on their own theatrical screenings, and then almost hired a um, a tour promoter to kind of put on on shows and stuff like that. We kind of a little secret weapon with that. So now, did you did you do um, four walling or did you actually get booked? The bulk of the the bulk of it was four walling. Yep, and then there was some split ticket sale splits um, happening as well. But the bulk of it was um, was four walling. Yep. Okay, and then and did you sell products at those screenings? Most definitely, that was <laughs> that was key. So definitely, merch table set up, uh, DVDs, posters, um, T-shirts, um, all set up with the merch table signing, signing posters, and um, and then also to the best of our ability, collecting collecting email addresses. If we were selling our own tickets through something like, you know, brown paper tickets or or right. um, Eventbrite or something like that, what we then had the email address and i even kind of for for the last film when it was out there i actually kind of had a a little preview that was me welping welcoming people to to the screening event and saying hey whip out your cell phone uh right now i know which is weird because yes. you know it's dark and and no one should you know whip out their phone but hey i want you to text you know the word inspired film to I forget what the number was four 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 two 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 and and you'll I'm gonna you know I'm gonna select some winners from that so you know that actually was a killer strategy because then you know not only did I get people's phone numbers but then they entered their email address um, within this and then as the film went on to some some film festivals and then I mentioned we kind of had a tour. Um, promoter that kind of took the film out on his own so i'd be sitting at home and all of a sudden my phone would just like go off with you know 60 text messages you know when he had the film out there and then you know that that played and then and then i waited about 85 uh, like 90 minutes until the film was done and then i started texting people back hey this is mike the director did you hope you enjoyed the film and people would lose their minds it's like dude that was awesome i loved it thank you so I don't know, just wow. unique strategies, right? You know, having fun with with this whole game. <laughs> now, did you, and you talked a little bit about hosting your own screenings. How did you do well with those host your own screenings? Some of them would would break even. Some of them, you know, made thousands. Some of them made hundreds. Some of them lost a hundred dollars. But but what I, you know, the goodwill and uh, you know, creating a fan and having that face to face. 
um, communication and then having them potentially go tell a few people. And then if we do. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, again, your earlier question about an email list. Well, now I haven't, you know, to be able to, if I lost money, I now have 70 emails that over the next five years, I likely generated thousands and thousands of dollars from those 70 people who showed up up, up at, a, at a screening earlier on. So, so that's kind of how I see that so yeah when you yeah if you get 70 people to come up to a screening up for a documentary about bike riding um they're pretty passionate targeted people they are more than likely the the percentage i'd imagine of them purchasing another product or watching another movie or renting something else you did or any it's very high because that's a hot and that was on the low end i'd say 70 was the you know between 70 and 250 is mm -hmm. generally the screenings um were and and that's that's worth the price of admission if you broke even you're winning if you lose 100 bucks you're winning you know unless it was if like a, you've got that lifetime value infrastructure and in, also infrastructure in place yeah if you have if you have the infrastructure in place to take advantage of the, that kind of opportunity to to better serve that that potential customer, um, all the better. Ap absolutely. Now, I was always wondering about those host the screening things, but um, and I also saw that you sold credits uh, to your film. Uh, yeah, a little bit here yeah, and there for like twenty five bucks or something like that. Which is, yeah. do you want your name in the movie credits? Twenty five bucks. It was like, <laughs> did that do anything? Did you make any money with that? So we so it let's see for. The kick, Inspired, to Ride, Inspired to Ride's Kickstarter, we did that. And then with this new thing we're doing now, you know, as we're editing this new thing, we're, I've kind of got a founding member sort of thing happening where, yeah, you do get your name in the credits and, and you get to win the actual camera that shot the original Ride the Divide. And we haven't talked about what RTD 10 is, but I think if you do it in, in a cool way, then, then yes, I think it's, it's, um, it's cool. <laughs> it's a it's a cool thing, but it's also it, it builds your community, it builds the audience, it builds the niche, um, and you're connecting with them. It, like they really are invested in you because now my name is on that movie. So now you've created a much more even passionate, um, right? Especially audience. you know knowing that these films are on iTunes and and these bigger platforms. Well, then it becomes bragging rights. It's like. Dude, come over. We'll watch this. You'll see my name go by in the in the, in the credit roll. <laughs> the, 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 I think as filmmakers, we forget the power of a credit because we you know, like we could just type in our own names because we made the movie, so it's not that big of a deal for us. But for 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 as they we like to call them normies, because um, <laughs> we're car Mike, we're carnival folk. We're carnival folk. Yeah. Let's oh, just yeah, we are carnival folk. There's no question about it. Um, so. But Carney and uh, Cardi's normies, they would lose their mind. They're like, oh my God, if they imagine being in a, in a theater and seeing your name pop up for the first time, oh my God, that would be massive. So, okay. and if you sell them for 25 bucks a pop, why not? It's like, or whatever the, the price is, but still it's a great, great strategy. Yeah, and, and there's sort of packages where, yeah, and as we're kind of working on this RTD 10, it's, you could also, you know, with the movie poster, we're creating a new movie poster, you know, again, selling an, an associate producer or a producer credit, which, you know, so many, how many producers, you know, buy their way into the credits anyway. So, well, there's that yeah, too. So yeah, there's, you know, I've, you know, when I was making films, uh, sometimes you'll see like six, seven executive producers uh, or produced by credits because they like, well, he gave me the grip truck and you know, he, oh, they, he brought the cameras. So I didn't have to pay for that for the shoot. So, you know, you do what you got to do at the beginning. Like when you're coming up, you just do, you know, you do whatever you can. And sometimes it's still, even as you're going, you know, if you can sell an executive producer credit for five grand, that's that takes me two minutes. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's that, that make that's more than any attorney on the planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's again if if you look at this as as a game, you know, a carny game, right, or, or or whatever, it's you know, it's, you you get 
you know, hey, step right up. <laughs> do what you got to do. <laughs> no, we didn't. look, as, as filmmakers, we all got to hustle and, and do whatever we can. But at the end of the day, we're providing that person who buys a credit experience and and bragging rights and an IMDb credit. And th there's value to that. And uh, I, I remember I sold, I bought, I think originally I might have, when I was first starting, I might have bought like an, an associate producer credit for like 20 bucks. I was like, Yes, I have an IMDb credit. That's awesome. But everybody that was like 2000 or 96, I think it was, or 97 or whatever it was when I did it. But um, but yeah, it, it's it's a thrill, when, especially when you're just starting out or you just want that that little shiny executive producer credit um, on there as well. And there's different packages too. You can sell like premiere tickets and other things like that as well, correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's it's, again, how can you surprise and delight your audience with – whether it be a credit or a unique piece piece of merchandise or or a bundle or a signed movie poster or or whatever. So again, it's I utilize the indie uh, music industry, you know, as as a lot, you know, from mm -hmm. from an examples, and I kind of steal. I, I'm kind of like a sponge. It's like, what industry can I steal ideas from that work with what I'm kind of doing at at the moment and. Um, you know, I think, you know, traveling musicians, putting on tours and selling merchandise and then putting bundles together and packages together. So I think as much as we can look out into other industries, and I, like I, you know, mentioned, you know, software as a service, you know, like what ideas can you get from the SaaS startup company that you could utilize as, as a filmmaker and strategy and marketing? So be open to getting outside of this little bubble of like, I hope I get into a film festival and someone discovers me. It's like, screw that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got it you, in, in today's world is because it's so much harder to make. I mean, even when you were starting out in 2010 and when I was coming up in 2005 with selling stuff, it was easier to make money. Like, you know, I sold thousands of DVDs back then. Um, now it's so much harder to generate revenue because the audience is more, uh, there's so much more competition uh, these platforms are taking a whole bunch of, we'll get into the platforms in a minute, um, but it's just harder. The more you can control multiple revenue streams outside of the standard distribution model, which is what you've done, the better you, because if sales go down to the DVD, but the t-shirts are killing it because they just happen to be really cool t-shirts, all, hey, all the better. And what's to say, you know, three years later, you can't drop a new t-shirt just like a band would, you know, here's our new you know, designs, here's three new designs. And then you even go to Facebook and Instagram. It's like, Hey, here's five concepts, pick, you know, what, which are your favorite. And then it becomes community engagement. And then, you know, the, your audience picked the two winners and now you go produce those and you're documenting that whole process. You're in the, in the ink printing, you know, facility, videotaping them, making it, they're now available you know, or, and then throughout that whole process, you've got them for sale for pre-order up on the website. So you've already probably maybe sold four or $5,000 as they're being made. And then once they're made, then you're documenting the shipping out, which generates just more buzz and more interest. So M Mike, you're talking dirty to me. Stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> stop it. Pre-orders, packing, stop it. It's just, just dirty talk, sir. Uh, <laughs> it's so wonderful to talk to someone who gets it. Like it's, it's, it's just such a wonderful experience. I'm assuming it's the same for you because you, there's not many people you can actually have a conversation about this with. This is, I, this is, you know, like people say, are you a passionate filmmaker? I, I appreciate the art and the steps of, yeah, we documentary filmmakers, we wear, we wear a lot of the hats we're shooting, we're editing, we're, we're everything else, but the strategy of, of, and marketing, dude, that. To your point, it's like, oh, oh stop talking. You know, that That's exciting to me. It's like, I don't know. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's what I always gets me excited as well. I, I mean, I'm an, art, I'm an artist. I'm a filmmaker. I love doing that. But I also love the business side. I also love the marketing side. I also love being able to think about how to put it all together. And it, for me, that gets me really, really excited. Um, it, most filmmakers are just like, I just want to make a movie. Right. But, it's like, but dude, that, that, that marketing stuff is dirty. I'm a director. I just want to direct. I just want to go from film to film and direct. And that's awesome. That's great. Um, if you, if you could do it and, and I can sure. promise you that's, that's 2% of the entire industry that gets to do that as like, like just go and direct and not think about anything else. And someone else handles it. Th those days are, 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 are gone. And there's a small, maybe two to 5% of all directors trying to direct the movie in the world 
get that privilege. Um, and and I've spoken to many of those directors on the show who have those. And even they, and I promise you, Mike, every, every, the bigger the guy or gal that I talk to, they all still have to hustle to get the next project. It's so fascinating. You know, we were talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about Spielberg and I'm like, yeah, Spielberg couldn't get money for Lincoln. He had to go hustle his money for Lincoln. Scorsese couldn't get silence made. He tried 20 years and he had to go hustle money from India to make it happen. Now he's hustling Netflix, but that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) Netflix just keeps giving him up $200 million to de-age Robert De Niro. (laughs) We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. But but that's the thing. They always have to hustle and and it never stops. It never stops for anybody, no matter who you are. You still got to go do it. But at, at the level that we're talking about, which is the indie level, you definitely can't hustle. Uh, you, you can't stop that hustle. No, without you know, question. Business is business. You know, what company do you have you ever worked for or or know out there that you don't have to put in? an eight hour day, or <laughs> you know what, even if you have a regular corporate job, you're still working eight hours a day. What it's just, you know, as indie filmmakers, it's like, we're just doing, we're still putting in eight to 10 to 12 hour days of work. Right. So Exactly. Exactly. Now, how big a part did I know? I'm assuming before physical media was, you know, DVDs and Blu-rays and that, that was a much bigger deal four or five years ago. What part does it play still to this day? What I haven't put out a whole lot, like a, a new film in, you know, in the last three years. So, you know, I don't have what a new product would do, but I just know from a, you know, from a library of stuff, absolutely DVDs have, have dropped off. However, you know, DVDs are still selling on a weekly basis from our, um, we've, I've now kind of moved from WordPress to Shopify. So Shopify site is kind of our main um, platform now and then Amazon, but, um, absolutely dropped off, but, you know, they're still selling on, on a weekly basis, physical items like, you know, t-shirts and, and bundles, you know, do well as they're marketed, you know, just from the kind of set it and forget it standpoint, you know, when you put effort into it, people making it aware that it exists, whether it be Facebook can, you know, retargeting on, on Facebook ads or, or an email drop with, you know, 10% off or, or, or something, then yeah, they, they move. But, um, but again, it's effort. You, you're, you're selling your products. Right. Exactly. And uh, yeah, physical products, I know, depending on the physical product will still do well. Um, and DVD, uh, people keep saying, oh, it's dead. It's not dead. It's not that it's still making money, man. I know guys were making a lot of money, but it depends on the niche. It depends sure. on who it is, where it is, some places in the world, still DVD is the thing still. Um, you know, Netflix still sell, still does the, the DVD by mail thing. Nobody Did likes it. Really? Oh yeah. They don't like to talk about it, but it is still a thing. Redbox is huge. I still still, you know, outside of front of my grocery store, I still, still, I see people in front of the red box. Yeah. So, so, so it's still, it's still going. Um, and if you could get a red box deal, Oh my God, those things are so, Oh, uh, we could talk offline. I could tell you the numbers. Oh my God. It's, yeah. it's insane insane best distribution deal on the planet right now if you could get it if a a good red box deal but anyway we'll talk about that later um (laughs) but um but yeah like i saw some like special wood covered uh dvd editions and things like that that you were selling for a premium like at 50 bones but that's something that the collector wants right right yeah that goes back to ride the divide we did put a bundle together we have a wood a wood box with a laser engraved um, sort of top and then inside was a, a book and a t-shirt and dude this goes yeah you did some you did some homework hey, man. this goes back quite a few yeah quite a few years so and we did um we did sort of a live thing with with a fan you know a few weeks ago and and he was you know there kind of you know talking and on his on his bookshelf behind him was one of those boxes like from 2010. I'm like, holy crap, dude, you saved that. He's like, no, dude, it's of course. <laughs> it's a wooden, it's a wooden case for a DVD. What am I going to do? And, throw it away? <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll walk into bike shops and, and whatnot. And there's, you know, one of my posters, you know, sitting up in a corner somewhere, you know, in, in a bike shop. And you know, we, gosh, we've shipped out probably 
six thousand posters over the last ten years between all the films. Yeah, and that's and that's that's a I'm assuming a good profit margin on those things. Uh, some of them were, were profit and then some of them just happened to be, you know, as we, like you mentioned earlier, when we went into a city for a theatrical event, I, you know, I sent posters to all of the bike shops in, in that particular city with, with a letter and, and everything else just to, you know, build buzz and, and everything else. So it's, and then with, with some Kickstarter campaigns and bundles and, and things like that. You know, yeah, the, posters. <laughs> right. And the thing is too, like thinking about it, because I've been in bike shops. I have I have a bike. I'm not anywhere near what you guys do, but I, I ride. Uh not the divide, I just ride. Uh <laughs> um, but um that hobby is expensive. And and bike riders spend money. Like it's not just buying a two hundred dollar bike. You're talking about I've seen bikes at six, seven thousand dollars. It's like, right. and they and 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 they're very passionate about riding, so they will spend money. So as a niche audience, to provide products for, uh, it's not a bad one to pick. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right, and and it is interesting. So we, I helped produce a, another documentary called Hair I Go Again, which was sort of about you know kind of like where where are they now from an eighties you know, hair, hair metal band. And, um, and what was interesting is like, I think I got spoiled exactly what you just described. Here's this middle-class, upper middle-class demographic with, with cycling. And then we were pushing out this hair. I go again, documentary with, you know, a different sort of niche and, and man, it just, it didn't, it did okay, but man, it wasn't doing what I got, what I got spoiled, <laughs> you know, doing with, with the cycling projects. Right. And people always ask me like, how do you make money with independent filmmakers? Everyone's broke. I'm like, well, you know, it's just about providing a service and things like that. But a lot of people come into the game trying to, to try to just grab money and try to take advantage of filmmakers and things like that. And I feel that filmmakers are the most abused demographic oh. Uh, of of an audience ever and they start with film school <laughs> like it starts with starts with paying obscene amounts of money for film school which you're not going to get an roi on for a decade if you're one of the lucky ones that can actually make a career out of it uh, in film school so it's i feel that they're just constantly being abused and abused Gosh, and abused and, and then even like the film festival it's like oh. the, it's the please choose me industry it's like please choose me please choose me it's like yeah we we've we've been oh yeah no, we, that's it, a it, whole other topic. You're right. And the, the, the whole please choose me. And I think what you've been doing for, for a long time and what I talk about in my book and what I've been doing is a long time is to take control. Stop asking for permission. Start building out your own system. Start building out your own infrastructure so you can make a living doing this. Can I get an amen? <laughs> preach, brother, preach. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so I see that you use, you use Vimeo and it was VHX prior to that before Vimeo bought them for sales of, of your own TVOD. Do you, and, and I saw that, if I was making it wrong, some of them are on iTunes or all of them are on iTunes and all the major TVOD platforms as well? Correct, yeah. And, and, you know, even though, yeah, as, you know, I put as much effort into oh, as much as I can control, I then, you know, as many places as I can get it from a traditional standpoint with iTunes and Amazon on demand and things like that. Absolutely. And, you know, I know people are like, what's the best platform for my film? It's like, there isn't a best platform. It's like any platform you can get on is the right platform to be on. So if you can drive traffic, it's, it's, of course. it's, it's, it's all about driving traffic. But I was going to ask you, what part is TVOD doing well for you? Because I've been saying for a while now that TVOD, unless you can drive traffic is pretty much dead for the independent filmmaker. If you could drive traffic, there's still some hope, but people's they've just stopped. And I know probably back when these were released, TVOD was still a thing. People were still renting, but they don't rent as much anymore because everyone's just got used to that whole subscription model. Like I, I you know, I pay, I pay, I pay ten dollars a month. I expect to get all these movies eventually. That's exactly right. No, we've been, yeah, Netflix has kind of ru you know, ruined it, you know, going back a couple years ago and even more so even more so now, but, but again, it's, it's like, you've got to keep at it as many places as you can get, then freaking do it. And, you know, yeah, things have, have dropped off, but you know, there's still, I'm, there's still sales happening on Vimeo on demand. There's still sales on iTunes. There's still sales on Amazon on, on demand. There's still, 
you know, ev every place the film is placed are ge is generating some some revenue. So, still, and still to this day on all these films. Yeah, it, it's you know, granted they're old old now, so it's not tens of thousands of dollars a month, but it's absolutely on a daily basis, like you said, with your book, on a daily basis, the films are being sold somewhere. And that adds up, you know, and if, you, if something you created 10 years ago is still making you money, um, and a lot of it's, pa a lot of it obviously is passive even, right. because it's just out there in the ecosystem. Yeah, um, exactly right. I, that, that's a, that's a win-win and it's not going right. to a, a distributor somewhere who's smoking a cigar and going, ha, 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 ha. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. <laughs> like, you know, that image of that cigar, that distributor, it, it's it's actually money's going to you and you are controlling that revenue stream because you decided to self-distribute. Um, and also, I was going to ask you, how dense is this market for movies, like documentaries about bike riding? Because I haven't seen a tremendous amount of them in my travels. Not in, in the cycling world. You know, I think so many, there's so much free content up on YouTube for, from, from cycling and, and, um, you know, that the extreme stuff and you know, like Red Bull is kind of got the market on the extreme side of things, um, which, uh, you know, they put a ton of stuff out for free, but, you know, with this ultra endurance, um, type stuff that, that I've put out there, it's, um, you know, there isn't that much out there. And, and I've got the mentality of, you know, this is premium, this is premium content. This is a premium story. It's got, you know, great music and tremendous emotion built into, into this storytelling. It's, it's a professionally packaged film and, and there's really no place you can watch the film, you know, for free, unless of course it was, it's on a TV network or something like that, where there's, you know, advertising on it or something like that. So pretty much every place my films are, are either rental or are transactional in nature. And, and, and you don't, you haven't gone into the AVOD world or SVOD world. Some of them have ended up there. I'm, I'm super intrigued by, by, by the AVOD type stuff. And, and that's, I'm almost work. what I'm working on right now, again, with the whole, you know, screw the gatekeepers. It's like, I'm actually working on building out my own bikepacking media company as you should, where I'm, you know, where, where it's on, uh, where we're going. It's, it's almost kind of merging, you know, Netflix and masterclass.com for bike packers. So it's going to be video content and how to content and, you know, on our own apps and, and web I will, I, I can, I can, after, after we get off the air, I can, I can guide you in this process. Um, if I've been, like. <laughs> I've been down that. So the last month I've been doing a, tons of demos and chatting with, with folks. And the deeper I go into it, the more my mind is absolutely being, being blown. So Oh yeah, we, we we could talk. I could I could definitely give you some whatever advice I could give you. I've done I've done sure. a little bit of it. So, um, and I, I saw another product that you created, which was and which is why I talk about in the book, educational products. Educational mm -hmm. products are so powerful because they tap into an emotion, a need of something that the audience really wants to learn about, and it's when you can tap into emotion. Uh, of of an audience member or a customer, that's when you can really make a, a difference in their life. So. Something like, uh, which was uh, your educational product called Bike Back, uh, Bike Packing Secrets, which was right. sold for like 80 bucks about how to bike pack properly right. with all these stars. And it's like 10 hours, something ridiculous like that. And I looked at that. I'm like, oh, God, he gets it so well. Oh, my God. That's just, <laughs> and it's just and that's just and that's all digital. So that's there's no packing because you're not packing 10 hours of DVDs. Um, Dude, so, <laughs> exactly right. Yep. And yeah. It did, and, and it did well. It did do do well when so with, with um you know it was stuff that we would put on the DVD extras you know how to you know bike pack and how you know the gear and whatnot so so then then it was you know people again I mentioned you know Netflix is ruining it because their people expect it you know to be free for with their subscription so the the thesis w was you know people are more willing to pay for information than they are content so Absolutely. so that's kind of where that came from let's actually package you know, in incredible how to information, what, what became masterclass.com. So this was, you know, perhaps the precursor to when, when masterclass.com kind of started doing, doing their thing and then, um, you know, bundled it up and, and put a, a website together and marketed it from a strat strat strategy standpoint, put, um, ad dollars behind it. And, and you're right. What, what 
my production costs were probably two thousand dollars to actually go shoot this how-to content whereas so it cost nothing to 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 shoot and and create um and and there was not a whole lot of editing involved but then you know the payoff is the strategy now the strategy about how to package and marketing and putting it out into your audience Right. And you're feeding and you're feeding the audience what something that they really want. You're giving them that. And it's an audience that you've already you've already gathered them. You're like, you love my movies. I know you like you like bike, bike riding and bike packing. Here's a course on how to do it properly. Here's a T-shirt because you want to represent. Here's a cool poster for your wall. And then you just start adding different product lines, different things. What other ancillary product lines did you create? Like, I mean, I'm assuming sweatshirts and T-shirts. Um, yeah. What are the things that you put together? Um, t-shirts, sweatshirts, posters, um, DVDs, Blu-rays were the bulk of it. And then just some unique little one-off items here, here and there. Um, like we took a bunch of titanium bike tubing and chopped it up into sections and put a USB drive. So you've got a titanium bike USB drive with a 4k version of, of the film. So, um, so I guess that's the bulk of it and, you know, mm-hmm. nothing too, you know, absolutely, absolutely crazy. And then from, from the t-shirt side of things, you know, we, you know, use our own printer, but then also some print on demand type stuff, which, you know, did okay, but not great. Um, so I guess that's as crazy but, as we got. But then you'd be, of course, selling credits, educational products, all <laughs> right. these other, all these are, these are all revenue streams. These are all for sure. These other, and then you use also Kickstarter to kind of get things going for each of these projects. Yeah, so, yep, exactly. So the Inspired to Ride film was made. So the Kickstarter for Inspired to Ride, which went back to 2017, was to kind of kickstart the world premiere. And the hook was, what if I could invite the entire world to this world premiere? So we had the you know, the athletes kind of come to Denver, Colorado. And again, back to the how-to type content before the film, for three or four hours earlier that day, we put on sort of a summit. So I, I kind of had a film festival mentality. It's like when you go to a film festival, you well, you attend panels and you and you kind of have discussions about you know different topics. So we kind of had sort of how to um, summit type things going on throughout throughout the day um, before the film in the theater. But then we again the whole inviting the world. So we we sold tickets to people around the world <laughs> um, who, could, who could attend. And this was before live streaming became, you know, oh. was a thing. I think, I think YouTube live, you know, just started later in 2017. So we were kind of, again, cobbling together live events, <laughs> live streaming events. And we had actually like 40, you know, people from 40 different countries bought a ticket and tuned, tuned in to, to kind of the, the summit that we put on. And then when the film screened, um, we did utilize VHX. So when the film screened, everyone got their email around the, the, the world to watch the film. And then at the end of the film, they could tune back into our live stream to watch the Q&A and, and everything after. And that did did really well, actually. Yeah, and, and um, the, 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 a lot of times filmmakers underestimate the international market. Um, a lot. A lot. Everyone here in the States... Um, only think about, oh, it's just the U.S., uh, maybe Canada, maybe the U.K., but they generally just focus on the U.S. And yes, the U.S. is a very large market. It's probably one of the largest markets. I think it still is the largest market in the world. Um, but um, take it from someone who's got an international podcast um, um, and sells products, digital products online all the time. International is huge. And there's so many people who – imagine if you're living in Nepal <laughs> – <laughs> um, and I've had it and they just like, I want to tune in and watch this. Like, b- because I, there's no way I'll ever get to go to this thing. I can't afford it. It's just at the other side of the world, but for 50 bucks or whatever, 30 bucks, I can t- log in and watch it. That is so powerful. Absolutely. Yep. And, and you're and you, right. And, and I'm assuming there's bike riders all over the world. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, UK is, is a big market for us. Yeah. Yeah. Europe and UK in particular has been huge. Now, did you, um, did you ever approach any promotional partners to help you market or sell this like bike shops or bike brands or anything like that? Some brands, you know, it was, you know, 
again, you know, difficult to get a lot of brands to, to say yes. Some brands have, have said yes, but yeah, I think it's just, you know, a lot like trying to go out and find an investor for your indie film or, or again, trying to get into, into a, a festival or something. Dude, there's still a ton of no's, even though, even though I've kind of got the three films, you know, that have done well, it's like, I can't call up specialized and, and, you know, say, Oh yeah, Mike, here, here, here's, I'm, we're going to throw you $50,000 for your next project. I, I still don't have that. And, you know, perhaps I haven't put the, the same amount of ener- you know, energy into it th- that I should have. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. But it's still a struggle. And, and perhaps, you know, I don't know where we kind of are going with this, but I'm, I'm still, you know, the direct to consumer. It's like, I would much rather put my time and energy into, again, using the frame surprise and delight thousands of, of people who appreciate, I would much rather try to presale $25,000 worth of my next thing to this audience who I've put the time and energy into than trying, you know, of course, if a sponsor is going to throw me money, great, but it's still a struggle there, you know, to get a, a yes is difficult. Yeah. With a, the, hustle, the hustle is real, sir. The hustle is real. You always, always <laughs> hustling, man. Always hustling. Now, um, now we talked a little bit about, you've mentioned it a couple times, RTD 10, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so Ride the Divide had its 10-year anniversary last year. So kind of in the middle of, of the pandemic, you know, we kind of put um, a virtual event together to kind of celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the film and and brought some some OGs in from sort of the Divide bikepacking sort of world and, had a, and, and kind of did a cool sort of three, four-hour, again, sort of interview type, type thing. And then... Then we watched, you know, kind of the film with a lot of the the people, the athletes who were part of the original Ride, Ride the Divide. And then as part of, again, with bundling, it's like the tickets were were $10, but you could also then um, order, again, to the pre-order, an RTD-10 bundle, which was a new version of the RTD-10 film with a new poster and, and new packaging. So we're actually working on, on that right now, which is going to be... So RTD 10 is going is is Ride the Divide's 10 year anniversary box set, and it's and I'm still working on what's going to be inside the box set. But there's only going to be a thousand of them uh, ever created. So you know, like the po- official movie poster will be one of a thousand, two of a thousand hand hand numbered, and then probably some some new physical items and T-shirts. And and this is where you know getting some brands on board. Hey brands, do you want to you know send us a thousand? of something that we could put into this box set bundle. Um, so that's kind of where, what we're working on. And what right is that going to retail for? Just out of curiosity. The, it'll probably be $125 for this, this box set bundle. So, kind of where we're, where it's so 125 bucks times a thousand. That's not bad, man. <laughs> that's pretty I good. Mean, and then, yeah. And then it's a it's a new version of the film. So we so the film is back in the edit bay. So we're telling the same story, mm-hmm. but anywhere from twenty five to forty percent of the footage will be different. So potentially new music and and new scenes and new stories because mm-hmm. we we ended up with one hundred and seventy hours of footage from sure from, you know yeah. covering the event. So so now it's it's like it's the same story, but you're seeing new, new, unique scenes and, and things awesome. that happened, which then I think could really inspire people to like go back and watch the original to see what's different and, and how it is told different. And then it's also a new film that ends up on iTunes and all the other platforms. So, and we get to go hopefully pandemic permitting some, some live events and back to our whole sort of uh, what we do. That's amazing, man. Uh, again, it's been such a, just such a pleasure talking to you, man, and talking to someone who gets it. Uh, before we get go, before we get, uh, before we finish, I, I want to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Break into the business. You said the word. The hustle is real, man. It's like hustle. Get on the phone, network, make connections. Um, you know, do what you can do. Gosh, dude, and any more? It's like again, this freaking iPhone. You know, I'm I'm holding. I just saw that DJI just came out with a brand new freaking drone that that you know it fits in your hand to to get aerials. It's like you can go create whatever the no 
whatever you want. So um, just get out there and do it. Hustle, make. Yeah, exactly. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Man. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's a tough <laughs> one. Um, gosh, the longest. I don't know. It's, hit, hit the next one. Let's come back to that one. Give your favorite films of all time. Uh, freaking Lost Boy. Just so yeah. good. So good. Yeah, going, it's like I was in, <laughs> I would date myself, but dude, that came out when I was, was in college and, and it was like a, a midnight screening of, of Lost Boys. And God, we were just drunk and, you know, having a crazy time up in the balcony watching Lost Boys. And, and then, you know, bought the DVD of that film and just watched it over and over and over again. Um, Can I tell you my Lost Boys story? Yes, please. Okay, okay first, so first of all, Lost Boys, arguably the coolest vampires of all time. Um, cinema, cinematic vampires, near dark, pretty close to it. But um, but they were arguably the coolest looking, they're just coolest vampires. Um a buddy of mine was an actor in Lost Boys 2. Not the one they made, the direct the direct sequel that didn't get finished. They shot footage, but never finished it. Uh-huh. So this is the story. The story was that you remember when Kiefer Sutherland got impaled, right? Well, mm-hmm. he, he didn't like blow up or sparkle um, or <laughs> or something. Um, sorry, did you hear the tone in my voice when I said sparkle? <laughs> um, you know, he, he, he didn't blow up or anything. So... He's in like the uh, in the coroner's office, and they pull the they pull the horns out, and he comes back to life. Uh. So that's how they were going to start the whole thing, and then he was gonna, and then all his guys. I think some of his guys actually did blow up, but he didn't. So he would then he just breaks out of the thing, and he just starts grabbing the first people and starts vamping out on them to build up his crew. One, my buddy was going to be one of those vampires. They shot a bunch of scenes, uh, and then. Um, like I think a week into it, someone, uh, one of the, the director walks up to everybody. Uh, he's like, um, we are, we're uh, announcement, everybody, we're closing down the production because Mr. Sutherland has decided to uh, move on to another project instead. And that was young. And he went on to do Young Guns. Uh, he wanted to go do Young Guns instead of Lost Boys 2. So we never got to see a Lost Boys 2. Uh, I don't even know if Joel Schumacher was directing it or not, but that is the story. That is a little tidbit, a little Lost Boys that's, trivia. <laughs> that's amazing. I had no freaking clue. And I remember my first time in, in Santa Santa Cruz going, holy crap, this is Santa Clara, man. I'm, I'm, I, this is the bridge that they were hanging from. So, <laughs> All right, anyways, so the other two. Other two. I don't know. I think Lost Boys, you know, that whole discussion covered, you know, number two and number three as well. Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Uh, and do you want to go back to that other question or just let it go? <sighs> Say it again. Rephrase it. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Dude, I, I think I've always had the mentality of, of, you know, don't burn your bridges. Yeah. And <laughs> I think that's just... <laughs> You know, yeah. holds holds so true, and of course, I, I've made, I've probably burned, you know, a bridge or two, um, <laughs> in my time. But man, I think that is, fucked. don't burn your bridges. You know, I ever, I ever I had a running gag with a lot of the guys I used to work with who were working in my my VFX company, and they like Alex, you don't nuke bridges, you don't you don't burn bridges, you nuke bridges. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's a, it's a thing. I, and, 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 and when you're younger, you do things like that. But as you get older, you start realizing how small this business really is. And from someone who talks to people on a daily basis, interviews and stuff, I'll talk like, look, you know, Kia, I know Kia. There's like, and it's, if you and I just met, oh, I know Kia, you know, it's, and, and if you screwed, if I screwed Kia over or you screwed, you see what I mean? It's so, it's such a small business and that's something that filmmakers really need to understand. They think it's huge. It is not. It is very, very small. Even these big guys who I talk to sometimes on the show who are very established filmmakers and big, you know, big making $200 million movies, they'll start talking about like, oh, this guy connected me. I'm like, oh, really? He connected that other guy too. And oh, he's like, it's just, fascinating how small the business is and it gets smaller on a daily basis. It's pretty great. So that's great advice. Don't burn your bridges. Um, and now Mike, it's been a pleasure talking to you, brother. Where can people find you and uh, everything that you're doing? Probably, you know, the easiest 
gosh, I don't, you know, MikeDion.com is a freaking really old website. I haven't updated it forever, but there's some contact um, information in there. Uh, the new project, RTD10.com, um, is a place to kind of go. That website will evolve and change as the project kind of goes through its uh, evolution over the next three to three to six months. Um, if you want to check out sort of the, the Shopify site, InspiredToRide.it is is that site's done, you know, incredible amounts of revenue from that site. So if you want to see a site that's kind of one of those direct to consumer sites that's actually generated some great revenue, you could check inspiredtoride.it out. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Um, hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to talk biz. That's great. And I'll put all the, I'll, I'll put those links in the show notes. Mike, man, thank you again for coming on the show, man. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to someone who gets it, who's been doing it. You're an OG in the film entrepreneur space, sir. So I appreciate that. Appreciate your time. I want to thank Mike for coming on the show and not only dropping his knowledge bombs, but providing inspiration to filmmakers around the world that it can be done. You can sustain yourself as a filmmaker doing what you love to do. Thank you so much, Mike. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmMuscle.com forward slash 464. And if you haven't already, head over to FilmBizBook.com and pick up a copy of Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. It has become a Amazon number one bestseller and continues to surprise me how many books that we continue to sell day in, day out, month in, month out. It's pretty, pretty inspirational. So please pick that book up. It will definitely change the way you make films. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 